الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد where in our introduction of Tadween al-Sunnah So inshallah ta'ala today's lesson is going to be about the following التدوين في القرن الأول We're going to be speaking about the tadween and we will explain what tadween means inshallah ta'ala في القرن الأول in the first generation we're talking about the Islamic calendar we're not looking at the Gregorian calendar we're looking at the what? the Islamic calendar how was the Tadween? Remember the first lesson that we had on Tadween al-Sunnah? I mentioned that at the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was the concept of At-Talaqi wa riwaya That was the first. Which is that the companions, they were receiving and they were gaining knowledge from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And what they were doing is that they were they were passing it on. The Sahabas were what? Were passing it on. And then the stage that came after that was so the first one was at talaqi wal riwaya. At talaqi means to retrieve and to narrate. And then the second stage that came was at tadween. What does Tadween mean? Tadween means writing down what was retrieved from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and what was taken from him. Writing it somewhere. This is called what? It's to document something. It is to record something. This is called what? It's called a Tadween. And the third stage that I said that came was a tasneef. What does tasneef mean? Authorship. The question here is, what is the difference between a tadween and a tasneef? A tadween and a tasneef. If you can all see, I'm not writing. The reason I'm not writing all of this I'm saying is because I already did. So I'm just recapping. I'm going over what we've already taken. The difference between at tadween and at tasneef is tadween is just to write. It's just to document something. It is to record something. Like in tasneef is to organize. Tasneef is what? It's tartib. It is to do tabweeb. It is to organize. It is to make chapters for it. This is called what? The tasnif. Are we all together? Are we all on the same page? Here is the important question, which is based on what we just said. The definition of a tadween is was there tadween at the time of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we define tadween to mean what whatever was taken from the messenger to write it somewhere was that present at the time of the messenger or did that start later that's the first point that we're going to speak about tadween sunnah Bada'a fi hayati nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam To document and to record the sunnah was it started Bada'a fi hayati nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
it's actually started at the time of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we're going to discuss that in the first topic and then the second topic we're going to be speaking about because all of this is the first first what first hundred years right or the first qarn, first generation we we'll call it generation so all of this is the first generation okay the second one is juhud sahaba the effort that the companions exerted and the effort that they put in fi tadwir sunnah al mutahhara in documenting in writing the sunnah al mutahhara that was purified wa naqliha and transmitting it ila al ummati to this ummah we're going to be speaking about that we're going to be speaking about the efforts juhud efforts of who the companions in two things fi tadwir sunnah al mutahhara in documenting in recording the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also passing it on we've kind of touched on that before but we'll speak about it from another angle inshallah ta'ala number four we're going to be speaking about juhud tabi'in the tabi'in are the students of who the students of the companions their effort juhud means what the effort of who at tabi'in fi tadwir sunnah al musharrafa in transmitting and passing sorry in documenting sorry the the honored the venerated the glorified sunnah this is what today's first hour lecture is going to be on these three points the four, first one I'm going to be speaking about in more details than I would be speaking about the other two due to a main reason has everybody written this I'm gonna rub off the two first the second two and I'm going to leave the first one on and we're going to go into that inshallah ta'ala let's talk about the first one Tadwinu Sunnah the Sunnah was written at the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there was something I mentioned previously which was at the time of the companions yes Hiv was the asal. Yes, there were people memorized, and their memorization was far greater and was far more than the writing. But that doesn't eliminate. That does not completely eliminate that there wasn't no writing at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions. So there was kitaba. There was writing. Like in this was the asal. This was the most. The, the most of the companions were memorizers. Writing was present, but wasn't the, the large percentage. Are we all together? Here we, have, we want to go into a discussion, which is there are some people, especially Orientalists, who pushed this concept which is hadiths were written after Muhammad sallallahu death centuries later two three centuries two three hundred years later I mean, two hundred something years later the Prophet sallallahu time there was no hadith written and this is something that is not true it was actually written at what time it was actually written at the time of the the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. so what we're going to do is this concept that the orientalists brought forward was responded by a great scholar and imam al-khattib al-baghdadi rahimahullah so his book is a kitab that responds to these or he was way before that he was the fifth century khattib al-baghdadi was what the fifth century 
okay, it's 900 years ago. But he already responded to these things, it's in his book. So what we're going to do is, we're going to discuss this book, Taqyidul Ilm. In this first point, what is it called? Look at this book, it's called Taqyidu Khatib al Baghdadi, Rahimahullah. He's the author, a great scholar. A great scholar. Rahimahullah, Rahmatan Wasi'ah. So, what we're going to do is, we're going to look into that book and that which has come regarding it. First of all, this book, he divided it into aqsam types. And he made the types into four. Like he broke his book into four chapters, four types, four qism. Are we all together? This book, Taqyid al Ilm. What does the book first mean? First mean? Taqyid means. Um, what would be the best way to translate in English? Huh? It's to fasten, it's to. Basically means writing knowledge. The word taqeed here, al ilm means to write down knowledge. To write knowledge. Are we all together? And the reason why he wrote this book is he wanted to show that writing was present at what time? The time of the Messenger. Alayhi salatu that was the purpose of the book. And so it's good that I talk about this book right now for two reasons. Number one, it's connected to our chapter today. And number two, the book fair is going on. And so this would also be a benefit for somebody, some of you to buy this book because at the ending of this book, he, rahimahullah, he talks about fadlul kutub, the virtues of books, wa maqila fiha, that which has been said regarding it. The virtue of books, having books. And the quotes of the scholars, and that which they said regarding books, and the value that books hold. So I would, advise you all to buy this kitab taqeed al ilm i wouldn't know which publication is the best because i haven't compared the publications but the one i have is the publication of darul istiqama dar al istiqama is the one i have and the one i read but let's talk about this book because it deals with this chapter that the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam his time the ahadiths were written so he divided his book into four. What did I say? Four aqsam, four types. The first one he talks about, al-athar. He brings textual statements that have come prohibiting writing knowledge. In the first qism, the first type, I mean the first chapter, he talks about or he brings forward, Khatib al-Baghdadi, all of the quotes that state it was disliked to write at the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Are we all together? So he first chapter, he brings all of the aqwal, or a lot of aqwal, and a lot of statements that show it is disliked to write knowledge. So he brings the Prophet Sallallahu statement. He brings the statements of the companions. He brings the statements of the Tabi'in. Here I want to say something which is, are we all together? So in the first chapter, what does he talk about? The statement that is, state, that is disliked to write knowledge. And whose statements does he bring? The Prophet. Companions and who? Those three. Huh? All of the statements that he brings from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of them are weak, except one. 
all of the statements that have come where the Messenger Sallallahu speaks against writing knowledge are all weak are we all together is what it's all weak except one hadith hadith Abi Sa'id al Khudri hadith Abi Sa'id al Khudri the hadith of what the hadith of Abi Sa'id al Khudri in Sahih Muslim where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said la taktubu عني. Don't write anything about from me. وَمَنْ كَتَبَ عَنِّي غَيْرَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلْيَمْحُ The Prophet has said, Don't write anything which I have said. And anyone who has written other than the Qur'an, then they should wipe it, get, erase it, delete it. Does everyone understand? So all of the quote, all the, all the ahadith, that Khatib al-Baghdadi who brings in his kitab Taqeed al-Ilm all of the hadith are da'if all of them the only one that we said is authentic is which one? Hadith Abi Sa'id Al-Khudri in Sahih in Sahih Muslim this hadith is Sahih Muslim this is the only authentic one which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said لا تكتبوا عني don't write anything which I have said وَمَنْ كَتَبَ عَنِّي غَيْرَ الْقُرْآنِ And anyone who has written other than the Qur'an from me, فَلْيَمْحُهُ لَهِمْ Wipe it, get rid of it, erase it. Even this hadith, even that though it's authentic. But the scholars differed on whether the Prophet said it or Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, this is his word. Does that make sense? They disputed whether it's the Prophet's statement or it's actually Abi Sa'id al Khudri's statement, if it's his statement and not the Prophet. Al Imam Muslim, he took the opinion that this is actually the statement of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that's why he brought it in his Sahih. So he brought it marfu'an. Where did he bring it? Marfu'an meaning attributing it to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لكن الإمام البخاري الشيخ الإمام مسلم the teacher of Imam Muslim and Imam al-Bukhari he said this hadith is not the prophet statement this hadith is not it's not the prophet statement whose statement is it? it's Abi Sa'id al-Khudri's statement so he made it what? he made it موقوف as in he said that this is the statement of Abi Sa'id and it's weak to attribute it to the Prophet Sallallahu And he brought a illa, a defect from the hadith in that, in that angle. Does that make sense everybody? So what we can say is we don't actually have an authentic hadith to the Messenger Sallallahu where he prohibits the writing of hadith. So Khatib al-Baghdadi's first chapter, that's what he tries to talk about. In the second chapter of his book, he tries to give the reason. Wasful illa. What is actually the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited the writing of knowledge? He's taking the opinion that even if we say this hadith is sahih, and even if we say that the Prophet said this, but was there a reason behind it? Are you with me, brothers? Is there a reason behind it? And he states some of the reasons. And I'll give you a couple of those reasons even if we take that the hadith that was saying that don't write anything which I have said they said that this means number one do not write the Quran and the hadith on one page because then lips happens you mix the two up because the revelation is coming down and you're writing what I am saying and you're writing the Quran as well it can mix up. So they said this is the first reason why the Prophet said, لا تكتبوا عني ومن كتب عني غير القرآن فليمحو. Does that make sense? So the first reason they said why the Prophet said don't write anything which I have to say is because writing on one page the Quran and the Hadith together is what he was saying. But if the person was writing on two different pages so he was writing the Quran on one place 
and he was writing the sunnah on another place the prohibition does not it does not it does not refer to him number two second reason was people will rely on taking knowledge from the things that they have written and they're going to dismiss the most important thing which is whose speech? the speech of Allah Azza wa Jalla like the people are going to put their hearts and minds to that which has been written and they're really going to dismiss the most important thing which is what? the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla are you with me brothers? Number three, Khatib al-Baghdadi says the reason why the prohibition actually came was the people will rely on the writing and give no importance to memorization. It's another reason. The people are just going to write everything and they're going to what? Not memorize what they've written. And that's the truth with so many people. They go to a talk and they know it's being recorded and they rely on it when they go home to write down the notes. That's wrong. At that moment, you should try to write it. And whatever you've missed out, then alhamdulillah, the recording can always back you up or it can help you, but it shouldn't be what you rely on. Also, one of the reasons why it, the, the prohibition came from the writing was that maybe when things get written in books it's the fourth reason when it gets written in books it may go into the hands of the wrong people who don't have knowledge but when they read things they'll understand it according to how they want to and then play with the religion like that are you all together brothers so those who are saying the hadith is the prophet statement this is their reasons they say that the prohibition was so now we don't have that problem they say now we can write it because there's no mixing the Quran with the hadith the Quran is finished we will know the Quran there's no problem in that regard are you with me brothers so we've now spoken about the first chapter which is Tadweenu Sunnah it started at the time of who it started at the time of the messenger alayhi salatu wassalam we're now going to go into the second chapter insha'Allah ta'ala so remember to buy this book taqyidul ilm by who? Khat oh I haven't finished the types of uh, how much did I mention? two chapters the third chapter is Khatib al-Baghdadi in the third chapter he brings the statements and the textual evidences that permit the writing of knowledge at the time of the Prophet like when the companion uh, came to the Prophet and he said Ya Rasulullah what you have said write it for me I want it written and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said Shah. write for who? Abi Shah and also the famous hadith of Abu Huraira Abu Huraira said no one used to write more than I did except Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As Abu Huraira saying this no one had more a hadith than I did Abu Huraira saying this except Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As he had more hadiths from me how? because he used to write when I never used to write he used to write when I when I never used to write so where did he just stay here? he wrote and Abu Huraira was with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when? Yeah? The last four years of the Prophet's life. The last three, four years of the Prophet's life. Some scholars, they even said that the prohibition was at the early stages of Islam. And it got abrogated. It got abrogated. Because Abu Huraira here is writing. So the question here is, why did Abu Huraira's narrations become more than Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As then. Today when we look at the number one person in terms of hadith is who? Abu Hurairah. 
Who is it? Abu Huraira. But Abu Huraira clearly and categorically, what did he just say? That Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As wrote more than I did. The scholars they distinguish between Abdullah ibn Amr As, he heard more from the Prophet, that doesn't mean he submitted and he passed on more. Who was the one who passed on more? Abu Huraira. But the question is why? Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As in his later stages of his life, Ghalabahu Zuhud wal Ibadah. Ibadah overtook him. He spent the last, last years of his life, or he spent a great, la, great portion of his life in Ibadah. So he used to worship, he left off teaching people or narrating narrations. Whereas Abu Huraira, what would he do? He would narrate what he heard from the Prophet. Well, Dalika, you know the famous story of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As when his father complained to who? His father complained to the messenger. He said, his father Amr ibn As complained to the messenger. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my son Abdullah, I have married him off to one of the most respected women of Quraysh. And he doesn't fulfill her rights. As in, all night he's praying and all day he's fasting she doesn't get any chance from him he doesn't have come come into contact with her so the messenger sallallahu alaihi wa said to him abdullah is this true he said yes O messenger of allah the prophet sallallahu he told him reduce on your fasting take he used to fast every single day he said take it from it until the Prophet ﷺ brought it to the fasting or they both came to the agreement that it's going to be the fasting of what? The fasting of Nabi Dawood. Kana yasumu yawman wa yufturu yawman. Dawood would fast one day and the next day he would rest and then he would fast the day after and he would rest. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, the Prophet said, even this, why don't you just take Mondays and Thursdays? Reduce, make it easy on yourself. He said, no. The messenger said, there will come a day when you're not going to be able to fast the fasting of Nabi Lahi Dawood that your body becomes weak and you can't do it anymore he said I can do it Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As became very old in age and when he became old he said I just wish I could take the Prophet ﷺ's advice I only fast on Mondays and Thursdays but I will take a benefit from this so the people said to him why don't you take the Prophet's advice now why don't you just fast Mondays and Thursdays and then he said I do not want to be a person who the Prophet knew him to fast the fasting of Dawood and after his death I changed I am now fasting what Mondays and Thursdays and the messenger knew me you see the concept of istiqamah to be steadfast to be upright to be consistent to be continuous and not to give up very vital yeah? and not to be somebody who's hype for something and just wants to do it now and then three four days later you leave it well the Prophet said Allah doesn't like an action that's big but you leave it what is he like something that's small but which is what consistency it's the quality not the quantity are you with me? Just something small. But you are consistent. You don't let go of this one thing. That's better. So the third chapter, Khatib al-Baghdadi, what does he speak about? The evidences that show that you can write knowledge. Then the fourth one, he talks about Fadlul ilmi wa maqila fiha. The virtue of books. Are you with me, brothers? What does he speak about? He speaks about he speaks about the virtue um, virtue of knowledge as a, as a benefit I just want to mention a story and Imam Suyuti mentions this rahimahullah and also Ibn Kalli Khan 
Ibn Kalli Khan, he mentions it in his kitab Wafayatul A'yan. Uh, in the tarjama of Sharaf uh, Al-Murtada, Sharaf Al-Murtadi, I think it's Sharaf Al-Murtada. This man, Sharaf Al-Murtada, he came to a shop to buy books. So when he came, he found the book. Um, he found the book Al Jamhara Ibn Durayd. He found it, which he wanted to buy. He paid the price for it. And you have to remember, those times the books were not, they were not published like the way it is now. Was printed in a printing house and etc. At those days, if a person wanted your book, they would have to copy it everything with their own hand. So I'd go to your house, I'd write everything from your book, and that's my copy. The copy that he brought was owned by Abu Hassan Ali ibn Ahmed ibn Ali al Fali. It was owned by him, the great Adib. Ala kulli hal, this great scholar who owned the book, the one who owned it is the one whose book has been sold. Abu Hassan al Fali's kitab has been sold. At the ending of the book, he wrote a line of poetry where he says, Anistu biha ishirina hawlan wa bi'tuha. 20 years this book was mine. I owned this book for how many years? For 20 years, I owned it. It was my own book. Now I have sold it. Now that I haven't got this book anymore, I don't own it. My suffering and my pain has become great. And then he goes on saying, I never thought in my life that I would come to a day where I would have to sell this book that I love so much. I never thought this would happen. Even if debt put me in my, into prison because I couldn't pay a person's uh, their debt, I never thought I would reach a point where I would have to send, sell, sell the kitab, Al Jamhara ibn Durayd. But because of my need and the weakness that I have now, it forced me to sell the book. And then he goes on to say, وَقَدْ تُخْرِجُ الْحَاجَاتُ يَا أُمَّ مَالِكٍ كَرَائِمَ مِنْ رَبِّمْ بِهِنَّ ضَنِينِ That when things become hard in life for you, sometimes you will do things that were so admirable to you, something you cherished a lot, you would be forced to sell it. So he wrote that poetry at the ending of the book. When Sharaf Al-Murtada saw it, what did he do? He brought the book back to the owner and he gave him the money and he said, keep the book. He went, this book means a lot to you. Huh? And this shows you, subhanAllah, the, the hunger and the love that they had for, for knowledge and books. So he, at the last chapter, Khatib al-Baghdadi talks about the fadl al-kutub wa maqila fiha, that which has been said regarding it. Well, some of the scholars, they used to say, a Muslim should not be stingy. When your brother asks you for something, money, something, well, give it to him. Except books. Ah, be stingy with your books. Rather than that, give. It's true because if you give your book to somebody and your book is 20 volumes, 20 volumes, and they say, oh, can I borrow the fourth volume? And then what happens is they go and they lose that fourth volume or something happens to the fourth volume or they leave the country or you don't see them again. You're now with a book that has one volume missing from it and it takes away the value of the book. Are you with me? So when it comes to books, the scholars were very harsh regarding it. And they mention it in their books of adab, meaning the manners of student of knowledge, that books is one thing you should be stingy with. Huh? If a person wants to read your books, come to my library and read it. That's how they were before. <laughs> And now that the book fair is happening, nurture yourself in reading, brothers. What do you do? Nurture yourself in reading. These classes that you're having right now, 
you shouldn't just depend on that fully you should have your extra reading times where you go and you read and you read so buy those books that a student of knowledge needs and inshallah ta'ala at the ending maybe I might give you a list of some books that I suggest that you should all try to buy that may help you and try to then read it familiarize yourself with these books now huh? which book? Taqiyyud al-ilm we said the best is writing down knowledge huh? what he means here taqiyyid is to write down knowledge it's writing knowledge taqiyyid actually comes from the word qaid qaid is to, to what? what did we say? it's the rope you use to hold down a camel or a goat uh, the word taqiyyid al-ilm I think I saw it yeah I think I once upon a time saw it but I'm not 100% sure let's move on to the second chapter what was the second chapter that we said we're going to speak about today? we're now going to speak about juhud al-sahaba yeah. read it for me so number three is Thaniyan What is it? So the efforts of the companions, uh, yeah? Fi tadwin al-surah Fi tadwin al-sunnah Al-mutahara, yeah? Huh? the efforts of the companions two things what were they what were they doing in documenting for us recording for us the sunnah and the second thing is transmitting it to what transmitting it to the ummah four points we're going to mention four points here. In this chapter, we're going to mention how many? Four points. Number one, how they would urge. So the first one is al hathu al hifd How was the companion's effort in re- documenting for us the sunnah and transmitting it for us? It was al hathu إِلَىٰ حِفْظِ السُنَّةِ الحث How they were urging الحث إلى على حفظ السنة Write the word على How they urged In memorizing the sunnah It's one of the ways companions the way that they documented it was that they gave importance to urging to memorize it the sunnah here the memorization can be two types okay how many types the first one is called hivl sadr hivl kitab hivl kitab The hifd is two types. They would talk about memorizing it in terms of it being in your chest. Sadr means your chest. And memorize it, keep it in your hearts. They would talk about that. And the second one was what? Memorizing it inside books. They would urge the companions to do that. That was the first way that the companions, they documented us for the sunnah and they transmitted it to the ummah. Number two, the second way which they did it is now. Uh, 
The hifd is two types, remember. I'm about dabd, the precision and the hifd is two types. Al-Kitab, the second way was, they would write bi sunnati they would write with the sunnah, ba'dihim, some of them to the others. They would send the sunnah towards each other. Al-Kitabatu bi sunnati ba'dihim say ila ba'd. They would send the sunnah to each other. They would write towards each other. They would write the sunnah and they would send it to each other. For example, for example, Usaid ibn Hudayr, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the companion. Usaid ibn Hudayr, <coughs> some of the sunnah that he wrote, he sent it to Abu Bakr, Umar, he sent it to Abu Bakr, sorry. And he sent it to Umar and Uthman. And they used those ahadith, he sent them to use it for their judgment. And the qada that they were doing, they based it on a sunnah that was sent to them from who? Usaid ibn Hudayr. So the companions, the way that they gave effort in documenting the sunnah for us and transmitting it to the ummah is to, is to remind each other by writing it to each other. Are you with me, brothers? Many companions, they did that. For example, Zayd ibn Arqamin, he sent some of the hadiths to Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Naam. The third way is, even though it kind of enters the first one, which is, Hathlu talamidhim. How they urge their students in what? Ala kitabat al hadith to write the hadith. So whenever they would dictate a hadith or they would say a hadith, they would tell their students write it. They wouldn't let their students just sit there and not write anything. So what they would do is hafthu talamidhim. They would urge their students ala kitabat al hadith to write the hadith. Hath, they would urge their students to do what? They would urge their students to write the hadith. And so they wouldn't let them. Ulidalika Umar radiallahu anhu, it's also Anas ibn Malik and others, they would say to their students, Qayyidul ilma bil kitabah. Narrow that knowledge, hold knowledge down by writing it. That's what they would say, write it. And it became a statement that the scholars use a lot, which is right. And nowadays, subhanAllah, you see a person come to a lecture and they don't write. You actually, do you not actually understand that writing some, something sometimes actually helps you to memor, remember something? When you write something down. Are you with me, brothers? Well, some countries, like back home, from where I'm originally from, the Quran is written. The Quran is what? Some of the students have never seen a Mus'haf, or they don't use Mus'haf. The teacher will dictate the Quran for them, they write it from the teacher's mouth on a big loh, huh? wooden plank. They write on it. That's how they take it. They go home, they memorize from it what they wrote with the Sheikh, dictated for them. And they wash it in the morning and they would come and they read to the Sheikh and they would write it from there on there. It's no mushaf. So the student would end up writing the Quran from the mouth of the Sheikh and he would memorize what he wrote. He would memorize what? What he wrote. Well, Idalika, when people started to depend on the, the writing, it's become a problem. I'll give you an example. How many of you in this room know a number on your phone other than yours? So if you had to call your wife right now, who knows their, her, his wife's number at the top of his, his head? But there was a, once upon a time, a time, huh? 
when people would have to memorize it because they would have to write, note it down they had little note- notebooks so now some people when they lose their phones they don't know wh- who to call صح? so I just mean what I mean from the angle is the fact that the people are depending on what's uh, what's written don't, nobody likes to memorize the fourth is which is something it's Tadwino Tadween Tadwino Sunnah Fi Suhuf Tadwino Sunnah Ama Tadwino Al Hadith Fi Suhuf The companions they had a hadith written for them for written for them in what? In Suhuf. Suhuf is does anyone know what Suhuf is? Huh? Yeah, scrolls. That's a good word. Scrolls. Sahabas had their hadith written in scrolls for them. Half of them had the Rahimahullah, half of them the Rajab Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He says in his kitab, Sharu Ili Li Tirmidi, he says, Well, Lady Kana Yuktabu, Fizamanis Sahabat with Tabi Ila, and Yakun Tasneef and Murataban Mubawaban. The companions' time. They didn't have hadith written in order like Kitab al-Tahara, all the hadith on Tahara and then Salah and then Zakat and then they didn't have that. Hadith was all over the place. So this is the concept of what? Tadween. Sahaba's day one was not organized. It was all over the place. It was just write the hadith down. This is Tadween. Tasnif was what? Ah. For whatever we're going to look at it later, everyone organized it according to something. Okay? One's book is based upon organization in terms of fiqh. Another one's based upon heart softening. But the point is that there came organization and a purpose behind writing. But the Sahaba's one was purely to keep it. ولذلك ابن رجب ابن رجب سين والذي كان يكتب في زمن الصحابة والتابعين لم يكن تصنيفا مرتبا مبوما إنما كان يكتب للحفظ والمراجعة. The Sahabas would write it only to revise it and only to go over it. فقط. ثم إنه في عصر التابعي تابعين. But after that the Sahabas time, صنف التصانيف. Authorship started. وجمع طائفة من أهل العلم. كلام النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعضهم جمع كلام الصحابة and then he goes on after that the concept of tasnif started لكن الصحابة they did تدوين if you now bring all of the hadiths that are written amongst the companions are you with me and you and you took those are you with me brothers that's exactly the books that are written for us in hadith okay I want this hadith from this page give it to me I'm going to put it here and so the tadween was already there. And what came after that was? Tasneef. ولذلك, at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the, uh, the Shia, they claimed that Ali has what? Ali has knowledge that no one else knows. What does Ali have? A knowledge that only him, the Prophet, told. That was, 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 uh, that was an allegation that was going around. So the people came to Ali ibn Abi Talib, they said, Ali, hey, the Prophet said, he hid something to you and no one else knows it except you. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he stood up to do khutbah al Jum'ah. And he, stood, and he said, Man za'ama, anyone who claims anna indana shay'an that we, meaning Ahlul Bayt, we have a unique knowledge. The Shia, they believe that Sahab, Ali and Ahlul Bayt have a unique discussion with the Prophet. He told them something unique. No one else knows. They only know. Ali said, anyone who claims that we have knowledge uniquely given to us which is not found in the Quran then he's a liar the only thing I have right now that the Prophet gave me is a suhuf which he then had it in his stick, walking stick he brought it out or some of the narrations mentioned his sword he brought it out and he read what was in it and now even that one everyone knew that's all I have so what we, want to take, what we want to take from the story is that Ali had us at what? Suhuf. So he wrote hadith. He had it on a paper. 
Now we're going to go into the third point, inshallah ta'ala, which is the last one, to be the Nilahi al-Kareem. Is Now we're going to go into Hey, Sally, son, hey. Juhud. Hey. Hey, Fi. The Juhud, number three. Juhud, the efforts of the Tabi'een, meaning the students of the companions, fi tadwili in documenting the glorified and the honorable Sunnah. The Tabi'een, they did that. How are we going to go through that? In three points. In how? In what? In three points. Number one, al hathu al tizam al sunnah wa hifdiha wa kitabatiha. So he said three, the companions were four, and this is three. It is al hath, how they urged al al tizam al sunnah. They urged, hath means to urge somebody, to, to convince them, to do it, do it. Al tizami to uphold a sunnah. They urged others to uphold the sunnah by what? By memorizing it, hifdiha, also writing it. So uphold, stick to memorizing the sunnah by memorizing it, by writing it and also what tathabbut, verifying. Fi riwayatiha Also verifying who you're narrating it from and who you're hearing it from. All of that was what? And also who you hear it from. The reason is because their time, the groups were coming out, so they needed to verify. Whereas the time of the companions, everybody was reliable. That's the first way that they, they looked after it. Number two was Tadwinuhum sunnah fi suhuf How they what? They documented just like the companions the sunnah in scrolls just like the companions they documented the sunnah in scrolls so did the tabi'in they also did the same rahimahumullah and the third one was juhud al-imamayni Umar ibn Abdul Umar ibn Abdul Aziz wa ibn Shihab al-Zuhri and the third one is the effort that was exerted by two great imams who is it? 
عمر بن عبد العزيز من هو؟ محمد بن شهاب الزهري they exerted a great amount of effort towards the documenting and the recording of the sunnah Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was one of the leaders who truly spread sunnah and he fought against what? innovation and he also gave a great importance to the what? the sunnah of the Prophet to spread وَلِذَلِكَ when Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri he said he is the first man to have written a book in hadith who was the first person to write it? are you with me brothers? who was the first person to write? Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri he was the first person to do tasnif in hadith ok tasnif but who commanded him to do it? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz he said right are we all together? when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz commanded him he sat down and he wrote and then after him there came inshallah ta'ala we're going to speak about it later great scholars came like Ma'mar ibn Rashid who then came out from Yemen and he authored Sa'id ibn, Abi, Sa'id ibn Abi Aruba he came out in Basra and he authored Al-Awza'i Abu Abdul Rahman Abu Amr Abdul Rahman Ibn Amr Al-Awza'i he came out in Sham he authored as well this is after Ibn Shihab also Ibn Abi Dhib he came out in Medina he authored Al-Rabi' Ibn Subay' Ibn Subay' Al-Basri he came out in Basra he wrote Shu'bat Ibn Hajjaj Abu Bistam Al-Atak he came out in Basra he authored as well Abu Salama Tahammad Ibn Hamad Ibn Hamad ibn Zaydin and Hamad ibn Salama. This was Hamad ibn Salama. He came out and he authored Rahimahullah Abu Salama Hamad ibn Salama ibn Dinar in Basra. Al Imam Malik in, in Yemen. Uh, sorry, in, in Medina. Al Imam Malik in Medina. Abdullah ibn Mubarak in where? In Khurasan. And Abdullah ibn Wahb in Egypt. Sufyan ibn Uyayna in Mecca Waki' ibn Jarrah al-Ru'asi in Kufa Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i in Egypt Abdul Razak ibn Hammam al-San'ani in Yemen All of these scholars, what they did? They all started Everyone started to do tasnif Are you with me brothers? 19 scholars One time they all started writing After Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri wrote No one knows these 19 who wrote first no one knows who wrote first the scholars only know like in they were in the same timing and we'll speak about that later inshallah ta'ala i'm going to write the names on the board for you for the next part of the lesson inshallah ta'ala in the next part of the class i will inshallah ta'ala i will do that inshallah ta'ala um We'll stop there inshallah ta'ala for this class. Does anyone have any question? Does anyone have any question? So alhamdulillah we finished Al-Qarnul Awwal, right? Al-Tadweenu fil Qarnul Awwal. We're now going to go into the next class, next lesson. We're going to go into Tadween fil Qarni Thani, the second century. Are you me, brothers? And we'll speak about that inshallah ta'ala. Does anyone have any questions regarding what I spoke about today? So the talaqi wal riwayah. talaqi means to take it from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. The brother asked in terms of authorship. And in terms of documenting and recording the sunnah, you said it went through three stages. What were they? The first one was At-Talaqi, taking it from the Prophet and then narrating it. That was definitely the time of the companions. 
because they were the ones who were the prophet that took it from the prophet and they were also the ones who what who passed it on the second stage was what tadween tadween we said the sahabas had that which we said tadween means whatever is out there just write it on a paper are you with me brothers and then the third stage was what this the real discussion of hadith is really when it comes to tasnif are you with me brothers when the scholars or generally when you study this topic of tadween sunnah you should really just study up to the ninth century are you with me brothers because that's really that's where it really stopped the efforts that were being put in after the ninth century in Islamic calendar everybody that came after that was just using what was already there and to be very frank and honest after the ninth century in the Islamic calendar the ninth century this knowledge of hadith went to the subcontinent India it moved to that direction and it was then put in the hands of the scholars of India and they then came out with the strongest and the greatest efforts regarding this science. Nadir Hussein al Dihlawi rahimahullah ta'ala, Siddiq Hassan Khan, Muhammad Bashir al Sahsawani, those scholars of that era, the Union brothers, way before we're talking about the author of the Kitab, Hujjatullah al Baligha, the author of the Kitab, Hujjatullah al Baligha, which is Waliullah uh, al-Dihlawi uh, rahimahullah ta'ala Waliullah al-Dihlawi was before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was older than Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rather Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's teacher was an Indian scholar Muhammad Hayat Siddi rahimahullah sah? who he took the hadith from are you brothers? And the Marwiyat of Bukhari and Muslim and Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi and Imaj and the Riwayat of the Hadith today, no one can have a Senate in Bukhari today except 99.9% .9 is going to go through who? Waliullah Dihlawi rahimahullah ta'ala. He stabbed. And in Marwiyat I saw it. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Walidalika the Rahalat turned towards that direction but that era there wasn't coming out new books or new style of, it wasn't it was shuruh explanations that were coming out hawashi footnotes tanqihat and tahqiqat authenticating what's already there sifting it out does that make sense so the person should really give a lot of importance to studying how the sunnah it came about any other questions regarding what we already took no okay we're going to start the next lesson inshallah ta'ala